service leaders, Mariga and Enos, it was beautiful, and Franco, thank you as well. All right, well, welcome to our Friday morning chapel. Uh, it's so nice to see all your smiling faces. And I'd like to invite our online audience, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and today we are blessed once again by the um, wonderful Michael Babienko. Uh, may we listen to the Lord's message for us this day. I'm going to invite our speaker right now to come out and give us our opening prayer. May you all be blessed. Good morning again. Ooh, we have sound today. Wonderful. Welcome to Friday. It's a beautiful day outside. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that Sabbath is coming. We are so grateful for the ways that you have worked this week. We are grateful for the ways that you have taught us in the big things and in the small things and everything in between. Please be with us now. Give us wisdom. Give us courage to listen to the things you have to say to us, each individually in our hearts and in our minds. Please help us to honor you today, not just during this chapel, but throughout the whole rest of the day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, I lived in Cambodia for two weeks shy of a whole year. It was a very long time. And it also passed by in a moment. Any of you who have traveled to another place know what I'm talking about, how it feels very long, and yet you wonder what, what just happened all the time. It was a year of many firsts for me. It was my first time doing mission work overseas. It was my first time living in a country where English was not the predominant language. It was. Uh, my first time living overseas for longer than two weeks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it went really quickly, but it was the best year of my life. It was the best year of my life, hands down, no argument. You know, and I, I really miss the people. And as I think about my time overseas, I often reflect on how missions changed me. So this is my friend, the motorcycle. Uh, missions made me realize in a new way the love that God has for me and his ability to work through me, even in things that I couldn't do. And we could spend hours probably with me sharing stories about how I almost burned a house down, or the spiritual attacks that I saw, or dogs chasing me, or all these crazy things. Uh, but today I just want to share one quick story. Um, so for example, the motorcycle. I did not know how to ride a bicycle until three months before training. A normal bicycle, like, you know, with two wheels that most people learn how to ride when they're like, you know, five or six or seven. Because uh, me as a computer guy and as a techie guy, I really didn't like anything that could, you know, get me close to something called death or, you know, injury or those things over there. And so I just, I just didn't do it. But I found out eventually that I would have to learn to ride the motorcycle in Cambodia. And uh, it was supposed to be my main mode of transportation. So uh, unless I learned to ride it, I would be a burden to pretty much everybody. So this presented a, a problem. I wasn't exactly excited about putting myself onto these two wheels where I could very easily fall down and you know, break a bone or, you know, I don't know, die. <laughs> so unfortunately, we don't have the time today to share all the details. But to make a long story short, you know, I got on the motorcycle the first time I got off. It took me uh, maybe 45 minutes to drive maybe a kilometer down and back on a road. And the first time I got off, I was uncontrollably shaking. I was so terrified. Literally, literally. Uncontrollably shaking. I was so afraid. And this happened time and time and time again. And I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying. But my testimony is, is that eventually I got on once and God had just taken the fear away like that. There was no fear. It was all gone. And for that, we praise the Lord. And then my further testimony is that the entire year, I really had no serious injuries on the motorcycle. The entire year. God protected me every single day I was on that thing. The worst I did was fall down and rip open my only pair of khaki pants that I had in the field. That was the worst that happened, really. 
But even more than that, I got to see God working in other people's lives. So when, when you go to a new place, I don't know about you guys here, when you come to Heartland, one of the best people you can make friends with is the person who's in charge of food. And so I was going to work in a K-6 school, and um, I decided to make friends with the cook, right, because I wanted to have good food. And so um, the kitchen pretty soon realized that I liked to eat and that I was friendly, and so they were, they were generous. It was very kind of them. Um, but I wasn't just friendly for the food, you know. You want to be a witness. You want to be helpful to people. And so I was. And uh, in addition, uh, the cook's two daughters were in my upper-level English class that I taught. And so we, we, I got to know the family, you know, okay, fairly okay through that. So the last Friday that I was at the Banong Project in Cambodia, um, the cook's husband passed away. The very, very last Friday. This, this wasn't entirely unexpected. Uh, he had been sick, actually, for a long time. He had been bedridden for a long time. And so it wasn't entirely unexpected. However, uh, his health had, you know, kind of plateaued for a long time, and then it kind of just down at the very end very quickly. And so uh, instead of having a nice final weekend of saying goodbye to people and, you know, having my last hurrah in country, I went to a funeral instead. And uh, it, was very, it was a very depressing event. Very, very hard, you know, because I knew the cook. I knew her daughters. And um, it's very, very hard to see people you care about mourning. But there's a distinct difference between the mourning that I saw there and the mourning that I sometimes see elsewhere in the world, and that's because this Christian was a Seventh -day, or this family was a Seventh Day Adventist Christian family, and so they had something key that some people in this world desperately want, and that's hope. There was hope that this family was going to be reunited someday. There was hope that Jesus would bring ultimate healing at the second coming. That hope is amazing to see. And you get to see God working in people's lives because when we introduce the gospel to people, we give them hope. These sorts of stories show us why we try. We're humans. We don't have all the skills in the world. We may not be the most uh, eloquent people. We may not have the most evangelistic skills in the world. But this is why we try. We try because our work in sharing the gospel gives people hope and it points them to Christ, and it points them to something eternal rather than something just here on this earth. So there's heartache, there's hard times, there's good times, there's joyful times, but when we share life with Christ and we see people accept Christ, that makes all the hard stuff worth it. This is why we try. The gospel changes lives. And so we see this in the Bible too, um, I'm just going to ask for the next slide because I don't know if the pointer's working. So if you could go to the next slide, please. We see this in the Bible as well uh, with Peter. In Matthew 4, 18 to 20, we are introduced to Peter. This is Acts. If we go to Matthew 4, 18 to 20, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. So Peter starts off as this normal, normal person. He's a fisherman. He presumably didn't have a lot of evangelical training, preaching, etc. He uh, was called by Christ anyway, though. So he's just a normal person working to provide for his family. And in the Bible, we see both the highs and the lows of Peter. Like, out of many of the disciples, we see, you know, kind of like this. Uh, you know, we see Peter walking on water, walking on water in Matthew 14. And then he takes his eyes off Christ and almost sinks. We see him proclaim that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Perfect. And then six verses later, he's rebuked by Christ. Six verses. We see Peter go on to deny Christ three times, even though he spent three and a half years in ministry with Christ. 
So Peter, Peter definitely had his highs, he had his lows. He's like many of us, right? We have, we have our peak, we have our mountaintop experiences, and then something happens and we're in a valley. Maybe we did something or they did something. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Jesus never gave up on Peter. What was the result of Jesus not giving up on Peter? We see in Acts a miraculous transformation of Peter. We see him preach a single sermon, and how many people got added to the church? 3,000. 3,000 people in a single sermon. That would be amazing. <laughs> we see him work with the rest of the Jerusalem council to uh, help them see that the gospel needs to spread to the Gentiles. Another amazing thing. And so we see God using Peter in miraculous ways. Did he still have his flaws somewhat? Yes. But Peter's life was transformed by Christ. Another story of a changed life is found in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. So here we have Philip, the evangelist. And he's going out, uh, well, let me just read here instead. Verse Five, chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So Philip is having a lot of success. He's the evangelist, he's going out. An angel commands Philip to go out, run after a chariot, get some good exercise, it's good for us. So in the chariot was a man of Ethiopia. This is verse, I'll just read off my paper here. A man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. Now, if you have charge of a treasury, and if you're in charge of and have great authority underneath a queen, are you presumably fairly intelligent and trustworthy? Yes. yes. But what is his response when Philip runs up to him? In verse 31, uh, we see Philip, uh, verse 30, Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He's asking a very intelligent, smart person. And the eunuch goes, how can I, unless someone guides me? We all know that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so even this man needed someone to help guide him. So Philip explains the scriptures talks through what he's going through, and the eunuch believes and is baptized. And we don't hear, we don't actually hear from the eunuch again in the Bible. But Ellen White in Acts of the Apostles, page 107, says this, God saw that when converted, the eunuch would give others the light he had received and would exert a strong influence for the gospel. A strong influence for the gospel. So Philip and the eunuch saw a transformation. God could have done this work himself. He could have sent an angel to minister to the eunuch in the chariot. Didn't have to tell Philip to get some exercise. But he chose humans to share the gospel with someone else. Acts of the Apostles, page 109 says, An angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel, and today, angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. The angel sent to Philip could himself have done the work for the Ethiopian, but this is not God's way of working. It is his plan that men are to work for their fellow men. Men are to work for their fellow men. This is our privilege when we get to heaven, we're done. The whole universe will know of Christ. We now have a unique opportunity to witness for Christ. It's our privilege. It should be our pleasure to get up from where we're at, our life situation from where we are, and to use our influence, time, and talents to share the gospel with those who haven't heard it yet. There's, there's one more missionary I wanna talk about just briefly before we end this week. 
because there's one missionary who has been a missionary to all of us, and that is Jesus. You might not think of him as a missionary, but think about this for a moment. He could have stayed in heaven. He could have stayed in glory with his Father. He could have stayed in perfection, like perfection that we don't even understand. We would have been in trouble if, if he had done that. <laughs> but he chose to come from perfection to earth. From perfection to this earth, to be born in a stable, to come in the flesh, to show, to show us how much God loves you and God loves me. He mingled with people. He taught them. He healed them, he encouraged them, he pointed people to the Bible. And Jesus' mission work on this earth is still active today. The effects are still being felt today. That's why we're here in this room, right? We're Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Christians. We follow Christ. Jesus' mission work is still being felt today. So as we think a little bit about what Jesus did for us, Let's review the questions that we've been discussing this work, what week. We asked the question, why should we go? Jesus showed us how. Jesus commanded us to go. Why me? Jesus loves me. He loves you. He knows our names. He knows how many hairs we have on our head. And he asked us to go and share this love with each and every other person on this planet. Why them? Why there? Because Jesus so loved not just a little bitty part of the world, but Jesus loved the whole world. The whole world. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16. Jesus loves them too, and you can be a part of going to help meet them. Or help them meet him, excuse me. Why should we do it now? Because Jesus is coming back soon. And we need to do everything we can before his return so that the gospel goes to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people, every people group. Why should we try? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives. And the lives of those who hear will never, ever, ever be the same. Because you, because me, because we all chose to go and share the gospel with someone else. One final quote. Acts of the Apostles, page 109 to 110, says this. The unselfish labor of Christians in the past should be to us an object lesson and an inspiration. The members of God's church are to be zealous of good works, separating from worldly ambition and walking in the footsteps of him who went about doing good. With hearts filled with sympathy and compassion, they are to minister to those in need of help, bringing to sinners a knowledge of the Savior's love. Such war work calls for laborious effort, but it brings a so-so award. No, a rich reward. Those who engage in it with sincerity of purpose will see souls won to the Savior. For the influence that attends the practical carrying out of the divine commission is irresistible. It goes on. Not upon the ordained minister only rests the responsibility of going forth to fulfill this commission. Everyone Everyone who has received Christ is called to work for the salvation of his fellow men. Everyone who has received Christ is called to work for the salvation of his fellow men. And that looks very different for many different people, right? But every single person is called to work for Christ to share salvation. Everyone. So my question to you today is, what are you going to do about it? We've seen why we should try. We've seen why it's important to reach the unreached. We've talked a little bit about the biblical basis for missions. What are you going to do about it? So, I want to encourage you to seriously, seriously, seriously pray about whether God is calling you into cross-cultural mission service. Maybe he's calling you to do something else to share the gospel. Okay, I'm not God, I can't, I'm not the Holy Spirit. But I want you to seriously pray about whether God is calling you into cross-cultural mission service. I'd love to talk with you about it. 
I have a table set up in the back, and I'd love to talk with you. But on the last slide, for those of you who may not like to talk with people, might want to think about it and pray about it for, first, we have a QR code. That's also for our online audience. You can use this to get in contact with me, use this to get in contact with our team, and we can talk with you about whether God is calling you and where you could go and share the gospel with those who haven't yet heard. So, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for everything you've done this week. Thank you for guiding in our lives, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share your love with other people. Because it doesn't just change their lives, it changes our hearts, and it changes our lives too, because we see how much you love each and every person on this world. Please give us courage to do whatever it is you're calling us to do today, right now. Whether it's sharing with a neighbor, sharing with a friend, sharing with a family member, or choosing to learn more about mission service. Give us guidance, give us wisdom, and please help Jesus to come back quickly. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Praise God for that message. Um, I would like to that we would all, you know, consider this, we would all pray about this. This is a high calling on our lives as missionaries. And um, I wanna thank our online audience. Thank you so much for joining us this week. And uh, we wanna welcome you back next Monday um, for another chapel session.